Did he show up, Larry? Larry, didn't show up? No. Send out the dogs. <coughs> I tell you what, after this week, it's been a busy week for us here at Betsy Lane, but any time that something like this happens, I just want you to know how humbled I am to be able to be a part of a congregation that loves and cares and gives and does for people the way the congregation here did this last week during the passing of, of Bernard Clark. Vacation Bible School begins tomorrow evening, 6.30, here at the church building. Be there, be square. Be here or be something. Come back tomorrow evening, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday for Vacation Bible School. You know, I can't remember the food that they're going to be serving, but some of it's cannonballs and some of it's seawater and some of it's something else, but... Listen, you have no idea how many hours have already been put into preparation for this gospel meeting. I was hoping that Jerry Roberts was going to be here today. Larry, I'll tell it to you and you can tell it to Jerry. A couple of weeks ago, I was teaching a lesson and I mentioned the TV show Petticoat Junction. You remember? And Jerry stopped me back there and he said, what was the name of the dog? on Petticoat Junction. I, I, I don't know. And he told me what he thought it was. Tell him he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> through, through many hours of diligent study, a lot of sweating and losing sleep. Actually, I just looked it up on the internet. The dog's name is Higgins. Higgins. The dog's name was never mentioned during the show. But there was one episode where the dog had run away, and the episode was entitled, Higgins Come Home. So, you tell Jerry the dog's name, Higgins. <laughs> out, in the, out in the foyer, the foyer, in Iraq, our good brother Jeff Newsom keeps bringing these DVDs and they're from the TV show In Search of the Lord's Way. Take them home with you and watch them. They're real good. They're put on by uh, the congregation of the Lord's Church. And a very, very good television program. If you don't watch it on TV, you can pick up one of these DVDs and take it home with you and watch it in the convenience of your time and your home. Thank you, Jeff. Those of you that are regular students of the Word, by the way, we're glad you're here. Those of you that are regular students of the Word of God will know that while our Lord was hanging upon the cross, He made seven different statements. For example, Jesus, the first thing He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then as He's hanging there, He looks down and He sees His mother. And He sees His Apostle John, the Apostle whom He loved, there together. And Jesus knows that if He dies, who's going to take care of His mom? And so he says to his, to his mom, Woman, behold thy son, meaning let John become your son. And he says to John, Behold thy mother. He's there upon the cross and the thieves, remember one on the right and one on the left, one rails against him. If thou be the Son of God, take thyself down from the cross and take us with you. And the other one tells him, Quiet, we deserve to be here. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he says to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus says to him this day, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Then whenever our sins are laid upon the Lord, our Lord can't stand 
And he cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus is there upon the cross. He's been beaten. He's been whipped. He's lost a great deal of blood. Then what happens whenever you lose blood? You lose your strength. And guess what? The liquid in your body, liquid in your body is gone. And so Jesus cried out a very human cry, I thirst. Before He dies, He says, Father, into Thy hands I commend My spirit. And then in John chapter 19 and verse 20, Jesus makes a statement. And the statement that He makes is, it is finished. This is a phrase that's often been repeated concerning the work of Christ. The phrase is, Christ finished work at Calvary. And it comes from the fact that Jesus said, it is finished. Our question this hour is, when Jesus died upon the cross, what was finished? For one thing, the suffering of our Lord was finished. In our day and time, we hear a great deal concerning cruel and unusual punishment. You spank your children nowadays, and it's cruel and unusual punishment. Back in my day, we had it coming. Today, it's cruel and unusual punishment. Mostly, it's applied to methods of execution, such as lethal injection, the gas chamber, and electrocution in old Sparky. In the U.S. alone, there's been 42 botched executions since 1982, one of the latest in 2014 in Arizona, an inmate took 640 breaths after he had been administered the cocktail that was supposed to quickly end his life. And the only reason that I tell you these things is, see those are called cruel and unusual punishment. The only reason that I speak of these things is to emphasize the cruelty of the death of, that our Lord went through whenever He was tried, convicted, and crucified. We know that Jesus was slapped, spit on, had the crown of thorns crammed upon His head, was taken out and tied to a flagellum post, and was beaten until near dead. That's what scourging was. We know that He had to bear His own cross, we know that the nails were placed through the arms, uh, lower arms and through the legs, that He was placed upon the cross. The cross was lifted up and dropped into a socket. It is said that the greatest loss of human blood during the crucifixion took place when the individual who was laying upon the cross, they lifted that cross up and dropped it down into a socket that had been made to carry the cross, they say that's where the greatest amount of human blood loss took place during crucifixion. And then Jesus bore all the sins of mankind and Jesus was separated from His Father. Of course, it was during that time Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? Talk about cruel and unusual punishment. And yet all of this was done to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies that had been made down throughout the centuries concerning the sacrificial Lamb of God that was to be given for all of mankind. In the year 690 B.C., Isaiah, the Old Testament major prophet, wrote about that Christ that was to come, that man of sorrows and acquainted with griefs that was to come. And he said, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Several times before Jesus was crucified, he had foretold to his apostles that which was going to have to happen to him. 
In fact, he said in the book of Matthew chapter 26 and verse 16, he says, I'm going to have to go to Jerusalem and there I'm going to suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Jesus knew that that cup of suffering that he had to drink was going to have to be totally drained. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Do you ever complain about what we have to do as Christians in order to go to heaven? Some people do. I had to get up before 10 o'clock to make it to church. Christ finished His suffering. <clears throat> His sacrificial death upon the cross was finished. Yes, Jesus said, it is finished when He hung upon the cross. And for one thing, His torture for our sins was finished. Well, let me suggest to you that the suffering of a Messiah wasn't all that was finished when Jesus died on the cross. We find that when Jesus died on that wooden structure, the law of Moses also was finished. The fact is, Jesus came to this earth to fulfill the law of Moses. Now let me ask you a question. You get down to the bank and you take out a loan to buy something. When that debt has been fulfilled, how much do you owe still? Zero. If you fulfilled the debt, if you fulfilled your obligation, then nothing more is owed to the bank. It is completed. Finished. And the paperwork that you signed whenever you took out that loan is no longer binding. Agreed? Sure we'll agree with that. The fact is Jesus came to this earth to fulfill the law of Moses. During the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord said in Matthew 5 and verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill and fulfill he did. Through His death upon the cross, Jesus abolished the law of commandments and ordinances that was against us, that separated both Jew and Gentile. The Ephesian writer tells us in Ephesians 2, 15 and 7, 16, having abolished in His flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make of Himself one new man so making peace that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. When our Lord died upon the cross, He finished that Old Testament law, taking it out of the way, doing away with commandments that were impossible for man to be found perfect in their keeping. Remember in the Old Testament law, there were days to be kept. There were new moons to be kept. But when Jesus gave His life on the tree, all these were done away with. As the inspired writer says in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. Why? He says, but the body is of Christ. Now we are members of the body of Christ, which is the church. We're no longer bound by all of those Old Testament laws, statutes, and customs that those during that time had to keep. So when Jesus died on the cross, people from all nations who had been separated can now eat at the same table be redeemed by the same gospel. The Old Testament law was finished. 
Since the Old Testament law was finished, then another thing was finished. That was that Old Testament law being the final judgment of man. Do you realize under the Old Testament law, if you broke one command, you were in effect guilty of the whole thing. The whole thing. But when Jesus died on the cross, listen, the grace of God kicked in. And it changed all of that. In the book of Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you. You're not under the law, but you're under grace. Under the law of sin and death commit one sin, and you are guilty of all. In the eyes of God you are dead spiritually. There's no grace under the law. But notice what the Bible says in Romans 8 verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who not walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So if we were to be judged according to that Old Testament law, we surely would be found lacking. But when Jesus died on the cross, Grace made it possible for sins to be forgiven continually. Look at what John writes in 1 John 1 and verse 7. He says these words, If we walk in the light, He is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. That word cleanseth right there in the original language is in what's known as the present active indicative tense. What it is, is it is a continual thing. It's like saying, I am hunting. I'm hunting. How long are you going to be hunting? I don't know. I'm just hunting. And it goes on and on and on. Where's Ronnie? He's hunting bear. I told you about the story about me running into the bear up around his house. Hunting would be something that continues on, wouldn't it? It's not, it's not just something that you're doing for a second, but it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. It's like saying, Margaret and I are married. Today. Now, marriage is something that goes on and on and on, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the tense that's used here where it says the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. Maybe there's a better way to say it. The blood of Jesus Christ His Son keeps on cleansing us of our sins. That is why whenever a child of God does something that they shouldn't do or they fail to do that which they should do in the eyes of God, they repent of it, they say, Father, forgive me, and guess what? The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, keeps right on cleansing us of those sins. Another way of saying it, grace. Grace. God's grace poured out so that we may have our sins forgiven. That way we can have full assurance that when we die, we know we're going to be right in the eyes of Almighty God on that judgment day. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, or the grace of God, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 10.4 For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So thanks be to the death of Jesus on the cross the Old Testament law will not be our final judge on that great and notable day. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last days. So whenever we stand before the great judge on that final white throne judgment day, what are you going to be judged by? The Ten Commandments? Well, no, that's a part of the old law. Jesus did away with those. He fulfilled them. 
What are we going to be judged by? We're going to be judged by the words of Jesus. The New Testament. The words that are recorded therein. When Jesus died on the cross, another thing that was finished. And that was the devil's reign. Remember, if you will, that in Genesis 3, we read of a curse placed upon Satan due to the fall of man. In this curse, God says in Genesis 3.15, speaking to the serpent or to the devil, and I will put enmity, hatred, between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The seed of the woman was the Christ to come. The bruising of the heel of the seed of woman took place when Jesus died on the cross, but the bruising of the head of Satan by the seed of woman was when Jesus defeated Satan by dying upon that cross. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 2 and verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he, Jesus, might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. By the death of Jesus on the cross, and that being climaxed by the resurrection of the Lord from the dead, Word of God says in Colossians 2 and verse 15, having spoiled principalities and powers, He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let me suggest to you when Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected from the tomb, that the battle, the battle was triumphant. Jesus had triumphed over the devil. One more thing. We need to realize this. We need to hold it near and dear to our hearts. We need to be constantly aware of this fact. When Jesus died on the cross, the wrath of God against sin was paid. What I mean is this. While Jesus hung upon the cross, He was bearing the sins of all mankind, a burden too great to be borne, and yet He took upon Himself that which all of mankind was guilty of. According to Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28, Jesus said that He came to this earth to give His life a ransom for many. I looked up the word ransom to see exactly what it means in the passage. It is the Greek word lutron, lutron. And it means to liberate from misery and the penalty from sin. So it says there that Jesus came to this earth so that His death on the cross will liberate mankind from the penalty of their sins. What's the penalty of our sins? For the wages of sin is death. Spiritual death. Separation from God. Jesus says, I came to this earth so I could liberate you from that. So you don't have to be separated from Almighty God. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 2 and verse 9, But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Jesus took that spiritual death that you and I deserve so rightfully, and He bore it upon Himself. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin. The Father made Jesus to become sin that we deserve, even though Jesus had never sinned. He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Think of what we just read. Jesus became sin for us. He became our sins. Why? To liberate us from those sins and the final outcome of those sins. Yes, 
When Jesus cried from the cross, it is finished, my friends, it really was finished. Not only was his earthly life finished when Jesus died upon the cross, when he cried out, it is finished, his sufferings were finished, the law of Moses was finished, we're no longer going to be judged according to that Old Testament law of Moses, for it was finished. The reign of Satan was finished, and the wrath of God against sin, it was appeased, finished by the death of Jesus upon the cross of Calvary. Let's be sure. Let's be sure that when our life comes to a close, we can say, it is finished. Not just that our life is finished, but that our service to the Lord is finished. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 4, 6-8, through 8, he said, I'm now ready to be offered in the time of my departures at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul could say, it's finished. I've done what I was supposed to do. God help us all to be able to say that when time upon this earth is no more for you and for myself. If you're here and you're not a child of God, make this the day that you're baptized into Christ to have your sins forgiven. If you're here as an erring child of God, make this the day that you come home so that when your life is over, when you stand before the judge, you can say, it's finished. I've done what I was supposed to do. The invitation is yours. Won't you come?